St. Stanislas of Jesus and Mary Babczynski, the founder of our community. I'd like to share something with you about his life and in particular way his dedication, his love, not only for the community but for the people of God and in particular way for those who are in danger of death. First of all, our founder was born into a peasant family in 1631 in a mountain region of Poland. While still in the mother's womb, a violent storm on the river capsized the boat and almost swallowed his life. But God's grace through the intercession of Our Lady had not only preserved him from death, but gradually transformed him and transformed this little frail shepherd boy who found hard to study into renowned preacher and confessor whose spiritual counsel was sought after by the king and by leading representatives of the church. He was an erudite teacher, very well prepared to be a teacher. He was a teacher in school, but he's also an author of works on intellectual and spiritual formation of students, of laity, priests, and religious. He was very well equipped to write erudite books, well known, because he would take the whole tradition of the church, from the fathers of the church, but also from classical literature. So scripture, classical literature as well, as the fathers were incorporated into his, into his works. So every time you read anything that he has written, immediately you go back and see the whole tradition, Western tradition, the Christian tradition, whereby he would give excellent uh, examples of what we should be and what we should do. Now at the age of 40, wishing to promote the mystery of the Immaculate Conception, he left the Pyrrhus order and established the Marians. Next year, uh, December 11th, we will celebrate, what will be the beginning of our celebration of 300th anniversary of our community. Now, throughout his whole life, he was guided in a special way by Our Lady, the Immaculate Mother of God, especially in the mystery of her Immaculate Conception. In the mystery of the Immaculate Conception, our founder saw not only a singular gift that Our Lady received by being preserved from the original sin, it was a singular gift of grace, but also, and it was in view of the, of the passion, suffering, and death of her son, but he also saw in that gift of the Immaculate Conception, in that mystery of the Immaculate Conception, something special for us. It was a, a gift to us that we also should be holy and immaculate. Obviously, by baptism, we were not preserved from the original sin, but God gave us the grace through baptism to share in that holiness, to share in that purity of God himself. <coughs> the Immaculate Conception and the mystery of this Immaculate Conception for our founder was a gift to the whole church, it was a redemptive grace for the whole church, for all of us that we are to be the participants, we should be the new creation which God initiated in, in, in his plan of salvation as he chose Our Lady to be the mother of Jesus. He also wanted us to be participants, fully participate in that incredible gift which is redemptive love. So our founder wanted the mystery of the Immaculate Conception to be also a distinguishing mark for our religious community, to be its constant support and true joy. He said, Mary, you console, comfort, sustain, and raise up the oppressed, those who weep, who are tempted, who are weighed down. O sweet Virgin, show us, Jesus, the blessed fruit of your life. Inspired by God's love, blessed Stanislaus burned with a strong passion for the salvation of souls, and he addressed his listeners with heartfelt pleas such as this. He would say, 
Turn back now to your father. Why do you wander through the distant land of passions, deprived of the loving sentiments of the supreme good? Go to your father. Christ is calling you. Go to him. In Inspectio Cordis, one of his works, we have these sort of invitations and challenges. Why do you want to be where you are when you have something beautiful, something good, something great? And God is giving these gifts to you. And so, to those who were wounded in spirit, he strove to ease their sufferings, to console them with hope, and help them recover their lost Christian dignity, especially by encouraging them to go to confession, seek reconciliation. He says that's where he spoke of, go to this special place, he called it the Inn of Pardon. Like, you know, you have hotels or places, just go there and you'll you feel refreshed. Divine love impelled Saint Stanislaus to become an apostle to the simple and to the poor, the socially marginalized, those whose spiritual needs were overlooked. He taught by word and example that sobriety and inner freedom are an effective antidote against all forms of dependence. You know, the society in which he lived, there's a lot of alcoholism because of wars. As you know, often wars bring all kinds of other, you know, social upheavals and, and sufferings. And, and for him, he wanted to make sure that the people who have become dependent, especially on alcohol and other forms of, of, of slavery, that they'll be freed, that they'll be able to, to live a life in Christ. And he also spoke that about ourselves, we can't do it. We can't heal ourselves. It is only with him that we are able to to find healing, to be able to find our, our happiness. St. Stanislaus' love extended also to the dead. After his mystical experience of the suffering of those in purgatory, he prayed fervently for the souls and exhorted everyone to do the same. Alongside proclaiming the mystery of the Immaculate Conception and preaching the word of God to the neglected and marginalized, Praying for the dead became the third principal aim of the congregation. St. Stanislaus wished that his followers would be zealous witnesses to Christ in the world. He wanted them to be powerful instruments of salvation, visible signs of Christ's infinite love and mercy. In his writings, he placed great emphasis on love, as Father Dan spoke at the very beginning of this liturgy and also as our gospel speaks. He considered that attainment of eternal life is rooted in love. And so quoting scripture, he often repeated, let everything you do be done in love. And so out of, the love of, out of the love of God, we are to perform every good and escape every evil. Out of love, we are to exercise every virtue possible, detest every vice and sin, bear every hardship and affliction and any forms of calumny attacks and out of love, love of God, we are to faithfully serve each other, to follow the rule of life, do our spiritual exercises, place trust in God and in his mercy, to love with a pure heart, joined to the merits of Christ the Lord, his Immaculate Mother and all the saints. In his rule of life, he left a powerful instruction. He said that each of you should keep in mind that the soul of his institute is love, and, to what, and to, what to the extent that one withdraws from love, he withdraws from life. So love is being the very measure. If there is no love, there is no more life. And especially in the setting of community, but we can also say that for family members, uh, wherever we are, love is life-giving. Without love, we, we who are very much impoverished. But what I'd like to share at, the, uh, at this second portion of this reflection is to give witness to the extraordinary graces and miracles that our Lord bestowed on those who ask for special favors through his intercession. Uh, I have to say that he passed away 
320 years ago, or 318 years ago. You would say, okay, someone in the past should not have an effect on us, at least to the degree. We know that certain people, like St. Anthony maybe, because we always call upon his name you know, to find things. We may also you know, ask St. Francis or maybe some other, maybe Padre Pio, although he passed away, we could ask him, maybe St. Therese. But we don't have uh, too much of sort of a need to call upon some saint, like, you know, let's say Stanislas of Jesus and Mary, who is he, you know, except for the community that we are. People would not be calling upon him. Although I have to say in our Marian Helper magazine, people begin to pray and they were receiving all kinds of graces, but most of them dealt with children in the womb, the difficulties they had. And I was always wondering, you know, he loved the Immaculate Conception. He loved the Immaculate Conception. A lady seemed to have helped him with the conceptions. And, and one of the miracles, the first miracle that he received, that, uh, that the, uh, this, this lady received, um, was a miracle which actually was used by the church to bring him to his beatification. So what was this, the firm, first miracle? There was a lady um, named Ursula, Ursula. She was 27 years old, who experienced complications with her pregnancy. She did have uh, one miscarriage already early on. She was admitted to hospital because she had some form of uh, complications where the ultrasounds showed a live fetus with a heartbeat. Her uncle, uh, worried about Ursula losing another baby, so he began to pray a novena through the intercession of, of Stein Stanislaus, uh, Father Stanislaus, to save the baby. Now, I asked him the person, I asked the uncle, he says, why did you pray to him? You know, he says, well, I used to stop by a Marian house near Warsaw, and I heard about him that he was able to actually uh, you know, bring children from death, he was, uh, he was very, very uh, uh, powerful at that time. But you know, for us, the people who live in 20th century, he says, well, you know, who knows? Maybe, you know, maybe they, you know, maybe there was some form of sickness that could have been healed in some other fashion. But anyway, so during the novena, Ursula experienced severe abdominal pain. She went to see her obstetrician, who was the department chief, who performed the ultrasound. He saw a shrunken fetus with no heartbeat, which indicated that baby was dead. He told her to go home and wait for a natural miscarriage, which was deeply sad, sad for her. Now, despite the devastating news, her uncle did not stop praying the novena. Most people would, but he didn't. Trusting in the extraordinary power of the Marian founder's prayers, who was known to have raised a child from the dead during his life. So on the fourth day, Ursula returned to her doctor who performed another ultrasound and found that the baby was alive. Once again, I have to tell you, I spoke with her and she said, I began to yell at the doctor because what happened is in that cool form, he was looking at the ultrasound and he was not saying anything. And so she says, doctor was wrong. What's wrong? And, 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 he, uh, and the doctor says, no, it's okay. And he says, what do you mean it's okay? What's okay? Uh, he says, no, it's okay. Uh, the baby is okay. She says, but you told me three days ago, four days ago that it was dead. And, and, you know, and she expressed all kinds of, of emotions because obviously to lose a child and now be informed that the child is back alive, the heartbeat is there, everything else there. And, and her last ultrasound showed a shriveled little, little being there. So now, not only uh, did this child was, was, uh, was born, but uh, this boy whose name is Sebastian, he's now 18 years old. Once again, I also had the pleasure of interviewing him, and he was sort of like a low-key, he loved sports. You know, he was not really interested in too much more, but he was very pleasant to talk to, and, and I think that it didn't really hit him, probably, what happened to him, that he actually was raised.
from the dead in the womb. Um, the Holy See, it took several years to investigate. They were trying to find out whether in fact he was uh, recovered from some sickness. But the doctors were opposed. He said, no, we know exactly what a child looks like when it passed away. And he, was, he came back to life. We can't explain it, but he came back to life. Now, this recipient of the second miracle, which is also approved by the church, was, was a lady named Barbara. She was a 20-year-old young woman preparing for marriage who developed a severe double pneumonia and was hospitalized on February 24th, 2008. Now, she was diagnosed with adult respiratory distress syndrome. After a, about a month in ICU, she did not respond to any treatment. She was on full life support with total organ failure and septic shock. Obviously, lungs were so compromised, there's no gas, you know, there's no way to breathe. Uh, you know, she was receiving some oxygen, but, but there's no, the normal process by which the body is able to uh, not only take oxygen, but also release all the, all, all the things uh, which, which have to be removed, uh, which will poison the body. So now, the chief of the ICU told the family that her condition was desperate, there's irreversible, with the death was imminent. So Barbara's mother, deeply distraught, went to the, her parish church where Barbara's catechism teacher gave her the novena to blessed Stanislas and asked her family to start immediately. Um, so on the seventh day of the novena, Barbara's clinical status began to improve, which stunned the doctors. I mean, here she is, septic, no exchange of gases, lungs totally compromised, brain did not get oxygen. I mean, she, if, if she were to be alive, you know, in, in today, probably people would say it would be a vegetable. But here she is, she picked up on the seventh day, and then uh, a couple of days later, she returned back to normal. They took x-rays, her lungs were perfectly normal, like someone who was brand, like a baby that was just born. Uh, and not only that, the, uh, the lungs were cleared, but now what happens to the brain and all the other organs which were affected badly? And everything went back. The only condition that she had is she had some problems with, with muscles because they atrophied for six weeks. She was not moving, she was in coma for the most part. Uh, so so uh, that was the only effect that she had, but obviously muscles can be uh, you know, placed back into good shape. I brought you these little things which I consider major things because here's someone who died 300 years ago, and yet the Lord gave him the grace to do extraordinary things for today because the miracles would be only would only be able to be proven today by, by sonograms. You know, in any previous ages, you could not do it. What I wanted to tell you is that the gift of our founder is a gift for our time today. I think the Lord wants us to know that he has the power, the grace for us to go back again, to cherish life, to pray for those who in any way are struggling. Uh, our founder in a prayer which was approved, uh, we, are, we call him patron of those in mortal danger. In some ways, a patron uh, of also of the unborn because especially those who are threatened with abortion, they are in mortal danger. She, he is a patron. We acknowledge him as a patron of those, especially of children and those who are in danger of dying. May the Lord then today give us the grace to find a deep faith and, and trust in God's power and his love and his mercy that we ourselves may embrace the path of life of love as our founder wished, that we may take care of one another, encourage one another, strengthen one another, or even pray for another, just like that uncle prayed with that powerful faith of his, nothing would deter him. 
and you know the novena of the of the catechist teacher who just happened to be in a church when the mother went into the, into the into the parish church and she found her there, and so she was the one who reached out and says, "Let's pray together. Let's pray the novena." The mother wasn't even thinking about that; she was so distraught. Her boyfriend joined in, by the way. Uh, after she recovered two months later, they got married, and they have already two children, uh, very b beautiful two kids. Uh, I, once again, I had the pleasure of seeing them because of the, uh, the canonization that took place three years ago in Rome. <coughs> My last words was something that we already have, the role of Our Lady, the role of Our Lady in our lives. In the mystery of the Immaculate Conception, God has chosen us to live, not just here on earth in happiness, but above all, to live with the expectation, anticipation of, of the true happiness, deep happiness in the life to come. Uh, this is something that is given to us. It's freely given, just as our Lord gave freely the gift of to Our Lady by preserving her original sin and gave her the gift of the motherhood, to be the mother of, of the incarnate word. So also he gives special graces to us that we may cooperate, collaborate with God, that we may one day share in the glory and share in the banquet of love for all eternity. In the meantime, we are to bring as many as possible that we may uh, bring all those that perhaps we may not even wish to be there because we're upset with them. But God wants everybody to be in heaven and we have the power of intercession, of love, and the Eucharist that we receive is the very power of God in us, transforming us to be like Christ himself, to be like Our Lady.